Super. Okay, I guess without uh, further ado, uh, we have a fair bit of material to cover and we'll talk about uh, grasshoppers. A little bit of background on them and uh, the, the, some of the predictions from last year and, uh, and how some of those uh, seem to be coming true this year, uh, as well as recommendations for control. So uh, a fundamental question, what is a grasshopper? Uh, so they're members of the order Orthoptera. Uh, so it's a very old group. Uh, people uh, talk about uh, cockroaches surviving major, uh, major, major catastrophic events. Uh, arguably, uh, uh, grasshoppers are an older group uh, and uh, therefore have survived a little bit more. Uh, about 250 million year old group. Uh, they're characterized by generalist mouth parts, jumping legs, and incomplete metamorphosis. And what that means is they don't have larvae, they have nymphs. Uh, so from a fertilized egg, you'll, you'll get the production of a neonate or a first instar nymph. Just a just a little guy, uh, and that period between the first uh, uh, the egg and the first molt is called the first instar. The period between that first molt and the second molt is called the second instar, and so on. So, with the pest species that we're dealing with, we have five nymphal instars, uh, and uh, finally uh, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the last molt is uh, results in the production of an adult. Typically winged, uh, and with our pest species, these uh, these uh, are, are fully winged. Uh, with some species, you'll see relatively short wings, which can be mistaken for nymphs. With all of our pest species, these are fully winged and uh, uh, excellent flyers in, in many cases. So uh, the group Orthoptera divided up into two suborders. So we got crickets, uh, the the Ancifera. Uh, and uh, um, we will get calls occasionally about these, especially about field crickets. So those are pictured top right. Um, these are actually important consumers of grasshopper eggs and of grasshopper nymphs. They're, they're generalists, they feed on plants, they feed on other insects. Uh, if it ain't tied down, they will try to eat it. Um, that is a, a camel cricket pictured ne next, uh, uh, just below that. On the right is a katydid. These are quite common. And finally, a, a Mormon cricket. Uh, and uh, Mormon crickets can be damaging, uh, but they're very rarely economic in, in, uh, in the prairies. Uh, we will get occasional uh, reports of them from the Southwest uh, and from Southern Alberta, uh, but only rarely economically important. They're, they're pretty big, spectacular beasts though, so uh, if you do see one, you will remember it. Uh, 24 species of uh, Ancifera in, uh, in, uh, in the province, uh, for the most part, not economically damaging and uh, can be actually quite helpful for, for regulating grasshopper populations in some cases. Um, the next is the Califera, the grasshoppers and grasshopper-like, and, and really this is where we're getting into the pest species. Uh, these are primarily herbivores, relatively low diversity as far as insects go, with 11,000 species world, worldwide. I mean, when you're talking about beetles, beetles, about 125, 130,000 species described. Similar numbers for uh, for hymenoptera or the wasps. Similar numbers for flies. You know, so you got your your, your hyper diverse groups. These are relatively lower diverse uh, lower diversity, but there there are still a fair number of species. We've got about 85 species in Western Canada. Only about four of these are typically problematic. So that isn't to say that the other non-pest species uh, can't be damaging in high numbers. They're all herbivores. Uh, but for the most part, the non-pest species are going to be specializing on plants that are not in cropping systems. So they don't represent a risk to crops as a rule. But there are a lot of generalists in this group, and you can get the occurrence of some of our non-pest species in large numbers in crops, and they can be damaging. However, typically we're talking about four species in the province. Uh, so here, just just pictured uh, a few of our a few of our uh, non-pest species uh, and uh, sorry the uh, the top right are, are two of our pests so we've got two striped grasshoppers so-called because of the two stripes you can see extending from between the eyes to the tip of the wings and packards right next to it where the two stripes uh, just extend onto the uh, onto the pronotum from behind the head so don't extend onto the wings these are, are closely related animals girls uh, from this species tend to be relatively large you know the size of uh, you know size of my pinky so Uh, Non-pest grasshoppers, good mantra, uh, you know, if, it's, if it has wings in the spring, it's not a pest. Uh, that comes with a big uh, asterisk this year because we are actually seeing really rapid development of grasshopper populations with the high heat that we've had. They are ectotherms, they really like it hot. So really the warmer, the better for the pest species. 
And we've got a uh, occurrence of fifth instar nymphs in South Central region right now of two striped grasshopper, which means that we are very likely to see uh, the occurrence of adults well before uh, well before uh, late June. So we are getting into mid June now. So uh, you know we're 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 going to see uh, occurrence of wing adults in in some areas. So uh, wings before late June asterisks. Uh, you know in, assuming that uh, the weather, weather is behaving itself with the very warm conditions that we've had this this early season uh, they're really speeding along however uh, brightly colored hind wings is a real real good giveaway that you're not dealing with pests we've got a carolina grasshopper uh, uh, picture top right uh, these are big meaty animals uh, and noisy flyers these are adults in the fall or in the late summer not typically pests. They are herbivores, they are large animals, but they're typically feeding on, on grasses and ditches and uh, you know, native grass species. Generally not a threat in crops. Uh, the next one is the, uh, the speckled wing rangeland grasshopper, uh, and I'm seeing lots of these ones in central and southern regions. So noisy flyers, uh, these things are about an inch long, um, you know, conspicuous uh, uh, ox blood red hind wings, uh, and, uh, and very active, uh, but yeah, again, very noisy flyers. Uh, so, you know, if, if the animals have got brightly colored hind wings or they're noisy flyers or they're callers or chirpers. Uh, so we do get a call, we do get calls occasionally about uh, uh, different species of crickets, uh, particularly in forages. And um, for the most part, these are not damaging. Uh, they, they can occur at rel relatively high numbers, but for the most part, they're not damaging. So if they're calling to each other, you're not, you're not dealing with a pest species. So when we're talking about the pests, these fall under three broad groups. And the first we'll talk about are the spur-throated grasshoppers, so-called. You can see the, the photo here with the uh, the red bar pointing at the uh, at the spur on the throat of the animal. Uh, it's not really, the structure isn't called a, a throat, uh, but uh, uh, you can see that conspicuous spur uh, for, for, uh, for um, the sake of identification. Uh, these tend to have short antennae, and that's a real good giveaway if you're dealing with a pest species versus a non-pest. Short antennae, typically a pest species, long antennae, you're dealing with crickets and katydids. So that, that's going to be a non-pest species, although they are still herbivores or generalists. So top of the head's going to be rounded, uh, face vertical or only slightly slanted, and again, that characteristic spur. So some of the short uh, uh, antennae or the, and spur-throated grasshoppers uh, include uh, animals in the genus uh, Melanoplus. And we got three of our real big pests here. So we got lesser migratory pictured on the top. And I'll give some of the characteristics for these so you can do field identification, uh, including of nymphs. Uh, the next one is Packards. And, and uh, as mentioned before, you can see that the yellow stripes just occur on the pronotum, just, just behind the head. Uh, and two stripe grasshopper, and uh, the two stripes on that one are very characteristic, and 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 you can see the black stripe on the hind leg, also very characteristic, and you'll see that in the nymphs as well in the upcoming pictures. So lesser migratory grasshopper, uh, sometimes confused with Bruner's grasshopper, which typically occurs in higher latitudes and higher altitudes. Uh, but in the peace country in Alberta, that it, it can be a significant pest, and in northern regions of Saskatchewan, northern growing uh, regions in Saskatchewan, can be mistaken for lesser migratory. It is a close relative of it, and even when we're talking about lesser migratory, we are talking primarily primarily about uh, uh, the sanguinipes. But uh, there are other two other species that can be mistaken for this one as well. They all have similar characteristics, similar behaviors. So functionally, you can consider these to be part of the lesser migratory complex. Uh, they are a medium-sized animal, 23 to 28 millimeters uh, as adults, and uh, black, dark grayish brown, tinged with red. Uh, and uh, you can see the red hind uh, tibia are really characteristic of, of the last segment on the legs, and the tarsi, so, or, or the feet, uh, typically colored red. And you can see that the, the two stripes on the hind femur are very characteristic. Uh, the, the wings are going to have a spotted pattern, and once again, that red tibia. You can also see bluish tinges or yellowish tinges, but typically red in this uh, in this part of their range. So they are omnivores. Uh, they will, much like our field crickets, uh, they will eat much of what they can tackle. Uh, they do prefer forbs, grasses, wheat, barley, and other crops, but push comes to shove. Uh, they will feed on other insects, live and dead. They will feed on dried manure. They will feed on whatever organic material they can find. Um, 
uh, and uh, uh, they can outbreak and they can travel at, uh, in very large numbers, great distances. You see their range extends right from northern Mexico right up into the Yukon and uh, and into Alaska and Northwest Territories. Uh, so they are broadly distributed across North America. Their migratory uh, behavior where they're moving in real big numbers uh, as swarms or engaging in locust-like behavior typically restricted to the southern part of their range, although this, this can occur in our part of the world as well. And we did actually have an occurrence uh, in the last year or so of uh, what was likely them being detected on weather radar, uh, flying at about 10,000 feet. So they can fly at great heights. They've been you know, detected at, at those heights in very large numbers uh, and fouling uh, airplane propellers and that sort of thing. So, um, and, uh, and, uh, potential problems for uh, for uh, uh, for airplanes uh, um, and of course they can move uh, very large distances when they're when they're engaged in that swarming behavior uh, so in 1938 uh, there was one swarm that was documented moving a thousand kilometers from South Dakota to Saskatchewan and once again commercial pilots reporting strikes uh, and uh, the migratory behavior isn't restricted to the adults uh, nymphs uh, especially late in stars so pre-flight they haven't developed their wings yet uh, they can be moving at 10 miles a day, so they can really get around a lot. So this this has implications for field by field control. Uh, of course, you can put down uh, you know an insecticide in the field and get good efficacy, control that population, and once the effective residue time for that chemistry has elapsed, then you can get movement of of these animals uh, back into the field from surrounding areas because they do tend to move around. So uh, I mentioned before some characteristic uh, uh, markings on those. No need to go over those again. And here are the nymphs, um, also relatively characteristic. Um, you can see that black stripe extending through the eye. You will see that on all the nymphs, as you can see here. So five uh, nymphal instars, a photo of the eggs at the bottom. They do overwinter as eggs. All of our pest species overwinter as eggs. So typically groups of uh, 18 to 24 eggs laid in, late, uh, laid in soil late summer, relatively shallow, so about two centimeters. Uh, and it's thought that snow cover can have, uh, it can have a profound uh, effect on protecting these animals from, from harsh winter conditions. Although they are pretty tough, they can take, uh, take conditions minus 15-ish, minus 18-ish, uh, and still survive. Uh, and this is associated with their super cooling temperature. So a lot of insects survive the winter by the production of proteins and or alcohols. And what this does is lowers the freezing point of their blood. Uh, so without crystal formation, they don't get tissue damage. It's not the cold that kills, it's the crystal formation and the, and the resultant uh, uh, tissue damage. So they can survive that. However, if we get a prolonged cold snap without, uh, without snow cover, uh, that can result in, in some pretty significant overwintering or overwinter mortality of these species. Get snow cover, they're pretty well insulated. They're going to be right around right around the freezing point uh, underneath this underneath the snow pack. So that is that is that could be a, a, a profoundly influential on them. And of course, we had a pr pretty good snow pack uh, in large parts of the province this winter. Uh, good, relatively fecund, 250 per female eggs. That is uh, typically going to hatch May, and uh, these ones are a little bit ahead of schedule uh, with the hatch. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about one of the other species that's really well ahead of schedule. Um, so the, yeah, these ones are these ones are moving along, and I am seeing the hatch proceeding in central and south central regions for uh, for lesser migratory. Uh, I haven't seen them in the southeast, and haven't heard reports of them in the southwest. Uh, but uh, I'll have a better idea soon. So. Um, young grasshoppers, once again, five uh, nymphal instars in 35 to 55 days. That all depends on temperature. And of course, it's very warm right now. They're going to be ripping through their development very quickly. So it's going to be the short end of that. Once again, Packard's grasshopper, you see those two stripes on the pronotum up top, uh, typically blue tibia. Uh, and these girls are big. Uh, so this is one of our biggest pest grasshoppers. Uh, arguably larger than two stripe, its closest relative, uh, as far as pest grasshoppers go. And once again, you know, about the size of my pinky. So um, uh, these uh, these animals can consume a lot of material as uh, as adults. There is a bit of a, a misconception going around about uh, uh, 
the consumption of plant material by adults versus nymphs. Uh, and it's probably probably best to stem that in the bud right now, um, or nip that in the bud right now. Uh, adults do feed, and they feed a lot. Uh, so I, I think this may have been, um, I don't want to say misconstrued, but confused maybe about you know, inflicting control on populations when they are nymphs, so as to, you know, you get a better uh, selection of insecticides that will be efficacious for them and you can inflict better control for them. Uh, however, if adults are, are present and they're feeding, you're gonna to wanna to consider controlling them because they are damaging. Uh, these ones prefer open, open habitat, light textured soils as a rule, uh, blue tibia again, and uh, greatest pressure in the Northern range. And these ones really like legumes. Uh, they tend to prefer lusher plants and we'll, we'll feed on small, uh, small grain cereals. Uh, but they do prefer legumes and can be a real problem in some uh, in some uh, legume crops. So looking at the nymphs here, you see uh, there's an oh, there's an overarching theme of green, uh, with the exception of the neonates. But yeah, green nymphs, short antennae. Uh, you could be looking at packards. We haven't seen big numbers of packards in the past couple of years, with the possible exception of some pockets near Saskatoon. But it's always one to keep an eye out for. Um, uh, once again, these overwinter as eggs. Uh, these are going to hatch May, June, five nymphal insars. I haven't heard much about large numbers of these animals coming up, and I haven't seen large numbers of these animals coming up, but it's one to watch for. Two-strike grasshopper. This is the prevalent pest species in Saskatchewan, and you can see the, uh, the, the black stripe on the hind femur and the two stripes extending from uh, between the eyes to the to the tip of the uh, tip of the wings, uh, females can be large, uh, and once again, you know, uh, up to 40 millimeters, 1.6 inches, or slightly larger in some cases. It depends on on their nutritional input as young. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, so they do prefer lush ha uh, lush habitat, uh, so heavier textured soils, forbs, uh, but they are generalists. And push comes to shove, they will feed on other different plant species. Uh, there is a peculiarity among some uh, generalist grasshoppers for uh, for obligatory host switching. So you will see grasshoppers in a field happily munching away, and uh, and then they can just move. Uh, and reason being is in the case of some, especially the pest grasshoppers, generalist grasshoppers, they have a little switch in their brain where where they can they'll, they'll munch on one species of plant, and then they're obliged to switch to another species of plant. Uh, they don't get everything they need from any one species of plant, and so it behooves them to switch hosts. Uh, so they can move in sometimes large numbers from host to host, so it's something to watch for as well. Uh, of course, these animals uh, are large and powerful flyers, and they can engage in that, uh, in that migratory behavior, much like, uh, much like a lesser migratory grasshopper, uh, and move great distances. Uh, these can be pests of alfalfa and other crops. Uh, when you see these ones in large numbers in, you know, a mixed alfalfa, uh, brome hay, uh, oftentimes you'll see the brome is completely untouched and the alfalfa is completely wiped out. Uh, so they, they are exhibiting host preferences in those in those uh, situations. They will, however, feed on cereals if uh, if that's what they have. Uh, so once again, overwinter is eggs. Uh, eggs start to hatch about eight to 10 days ahead of migratory grasshopper, and it was well ahead this year. So these animals were actually hatching about eight to 10 days ahead of schedule. So about second week of May, third week of May, we were getting reports of large numbers of nymphs uh, coming up and oftentimes damaging uh, numbers of nymphs. So that, that required spray. Uh, so, you know, third instar nymphs, second instar nymphs causing enough damage to, to warrant uh, to warrant spray. Uh, once again, the migratory behavior of both nymphs and ad adults, these tend to invade from field edges. They're gonna overwinter, they're gonna be laying eggs in ditches and roadsides and moving into crops from those. But once again, they can move great distances, which makes you know control in indiv individual fields occasionally very complicated. Uh, you can see that black stripe is characteristic on, on all of the nymphal stages and, uh, and all of the adults uh, looking at the hind tibia. Um, we are seeing fourths uh, in uh, in the uh, uh, the Regina area and Lumsden area, uh, and in some other areas as well. So they are really speeding through their development quickly. 
So banded wing grasshoppers, this is the second group that we'll talk about. There's only one species that's a major pest. Uh, and this one can be a, a serious pest of cereals. Uh, this is a clear wing, the clear wing grasshopper, primarily a grass feeder, and they can be a devastating pest in, uh, in uh, cereal crops. Uh, so yellow to brown modeled four wings and transparent hind wings. Uh, you're going to see those that the, those light stripes that converge. And what's really characteristic about these ones is that camouflage pattern on the on the uh, on the four wings. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, very characteristic of these animals. They're not as big as two striped or backwards. Uh, so uh, uh, they're going to be you know in the inch range. You know medium sized grasshopper. Of course, it's a numbers game. Uh, uh, they, they occur in very large numbers and can be very damaging. Uh, another characteristic feature is that perine or the keels on the pronotum and you can see that that little ridge. You may not be able to see that without a field glass but it's very distinctive of this of this animal uh, and you can see as well this this is a native. It does occur uh, throughout North America uh, including large portions of Saskatchewan. So once again overwinter is eggs. Uh, the uh, the nymphs are relatively characteristic, especially the neonates. You can see that black and white pattern, uh, very characteristic of their of their first instar. So if you st start to see these coming up, these ones tend to come up early. So I'm thinking if if there are areas with relatively light sandy soil, south aspect, uh, these are well on their on their way to, to developing. I haven't heard specific reports about clearing grasshopper. Uh, however, we have had localized populations of, of very large numbers. Uh, what we'll see, and we'll talk about a little bit, is uh, is uh, soil moisture and its impact on grasshopper development. And these ones are very sensitive to it. Uh, so they need a little bit of moisture, and this, this is uh, uh, timed with uh, conditions that will produce a bit of green feed for those nymphs to consume. So you're going to see, uh, um, you know, with, with rapidly rising temperatures and following a shower, those conditions are going to be are going to be associated with, you know, the potential for food sources coming up, and that's going to stimulate them patch. So of course we had some very very timely rains uh, in large parts of the province, and we've had very warm temperatures. So uh, every reason to expect uh, problems with this animal this year. Although I have, I haven't heard specific reports to date. Uh, we can also see problems with slant-faced grasshoppers, and this is a relatively large group. Uh, 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 er Eretetics here is uh, is uh, just offered as a, as a sample. Uh, you can see why they're called slant-faced grasshoppers. These are only occasionally pests, uh, but they can occur in numbers that are large enough to be damaging. Usually found near wet uh, wet areas, and of course we do have a lot of wet areas this year uh, in different parts of the province, uh, particularly in the northeast and southeast. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so yeah, under dry conditions, these don't fare as well. Uh, some members of this, uh, of this group are also common in dry grassy fields and pastures. It is a relatively large group. Uh, they feed primarily on range, rangeland grasses and sedges, but they can be a problem in crops too. So grasshopper development, I, I, I indicated that we were talking about some of the factors that are gonna influence uh, uh, population numbers and uh, population success. Uh, and probably one of the most important is, is temperature. Uh, they, they are ectotherms, all, all insects are ectotherms and all aspects of their development and their physiology and their behavior are influenced by temperature. So they, uh, uh, what's occurring inside that egg, of course, is the development of an embryo. High, late summer and fall temperatures are going to speed development of that embryo. And of course, we had warm conditions late summer and fall last year. Um, and then they're going to enter into what's called a, a state of diapause. And it's a little bit like hibernation, but it is, uh, it's, it's associated strictly with arrested development. So that embryo is gonna stop developing and it won't continue developing until the conditions are favorable for that. And that includes warm spring conditions are gonna, and that, that's gonna, gonna uh, cause, what's a, a call, cause what's called a break in diapause and allow them to complete development and hatch. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail and some of the, uh, some of the interactions of different factors. Uh, so moisture, very important. Uh, eggs must absorb water. They are not standalone units in the soil. Uh, they're still interacting with their environment. Uh, it's uh, a minimum soil moisture of 13.5% is necessary for egg development. And embryonic development can only proceed until, uh, until completion of early development at 13.5, but will cease if dry conditions occur. So this allows them to remain in, in, a, uh, in a, uh, a state of arrested development until conditions improve. 
So, and they can stay in this condition for, uh, you know, additional years. Uh, so delayed development or delayed diapause is relatively common in insects where the environment is a little bit uncertain. And of course, on the prairies, uh, there are no guarantees. Uh, and all, of course, all of these animals are native and have evolved in these conditions of consistent uncertainty. So that development is going to halt until moisture uh, uh, increases. Dry, uh, dry conditions after this stage are, are going to slow development again, but they're not going to stop it. Uh, what you will see is egg death if moisture drops below one third. So temperature can kill those very low temperatures without the protective effect of uh, snow cover and very dry conditions. So ex exceedingly dry conditions can kill grasshoppers as well. Uh, dry conditions as a rule are going to benefit their populations and, and I'll, I'll show, you, show you what that means, but they're, 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 there is a distinction between dry and very dry. So really what we're talking about is, is a period. So all of the temperature effects over the winter are going to influence that stage of development. And uh, just for uh, for uh, um, compl completion of thought, just uh, just a, a cartoon and some uh, some uh, some photographs of uh, grasshoppers developing inside their eggs. So moisture and temperature interact, of course, and both of these are extremely important. Uh, it's it, the initial thinking in the 70s and up until relatively recent recently was that we had a linear effect. And of course, you can see this this linear relationship well documented. Uh, it's thought now that it's not a linear uh, uh, relationship. It's it, it, there is a plateau and a fall off, of course, with temperature, as is the case with with with, mo with most insects. So it is possible to be too warm for these animals to develop, and there's lots of evidence of that. Uh, you can see, uh, you know, these these starts and stops of development, and and the uh, the second part of this figure is showing that. Uh, and these are associated with, you know, the loss and accumulation of moisture. So you can get that halt of development with uh, with uh, insufficient moisture, and then completion of development, and then that secondary uh, slowing of development with loss of moisture. So uh, one, uh, uh, so moisture and temperature, these are going to interact with other organisms that feed on grasshoppers as well as grasshoppers. And a really important uh, component of this are fungal pathogens. And I'll just talk about a couple of them, to a couple of the most important ones. One is Boveria bassiana. Uh, and this one's actually being explored as a, as a biological control of grasshoppers and ligus and a number of different pests. Some of them, some of the isolates are very specific uh, and they can be very potent pathogens of these animals that really knock down populations relatively quickly. However, uh, Grasshoppers have a way around this, and it's called what uh, some have described it as a behavioral fever. Uh, so they will actually engage in basking once infected to raise their internal temperatures uh, and uh, right up into the 40s. And this is going to reduce the success of the fungal pathogen. It's a reason that we uh, express fevers when we're when we're you know infected with a pathogen as well. Is to slow the slow the uh, the progress of that pathogen. Grasshoppers just happen to do it behaviorally, where we as we, we do it physiologically. And so grasshoppers really like it warm as a rule, and they will raise their internal temperatures to uh, to fight off sickness. However, Bovaria can be a significant mortality factor. Another significant more, more mortality factor uh, is Entomoptera grillii. Uh, so this fungal pathogen is associated with humid conditions and cool conditions. Uh, you will see outbreaks, local outbreaks of this in conditions that are conducive with the production of thunderstorms. And of course, we've seen a fair bit of that this year already. I haven't heard any reports of large populations of grasshoppers being infected with Entomoptera, but last year we had large acreages of, of grasshoppers climbing to the tops of plants infected with the Entomoptera. It obliges them to climb to the top of a plant grab on for dear life and die. And once it begins to uh, to disintegrate, it's going to rain fu uh, uh, fungal spores down onto its brothers and sisters and pals and subsequently infect the rest of the population. They'll climb up and you can you can see how this this would increase exponentially in the, in the infectivity. Um, so there have been uh, outbreaks that have been stemmed by outbreaks of, uh, of uh, or epizootics of uh, Entomoptera. So an epizootic is like an epidemic, but uh, associated with a non-human species. Uh, so late 30s, late 40s, early 60s, uh, major outbreaks uh, terminated by cool wet weather 
and subsequent outbreaks of Entomophthora. So really what's what's going to stem our, our current trend of large grasshopper populations is cool wet weather. Um, we, uh, we of course uh, are left to try to control these animals, but uh, uh, functionally, it's it's the weather that's gonna that's gonna limit their uh, their impact in broad areas. They also have a, a host of natural enemies, and we'll just we'll talk about a few of these. Uh, starting with blister beetles, these are epicotta blister beetles. These are relatively large animals, about an inch long, gray. There are other members of the epicotta that you can see they're you know about half that size and kind of coppery color. You're gonna see these munching on flowers in uh, in fields. Not typically economically damaging, although they can do a lot of damage to small plot research uh, and be a real headache for researchers uh, in, in a commercial field setting they're they're very rarely economically damaging they will much on flowers however uh, what's really going after the grasshoppers however is not the adults it's going to be that uh, that little beast uh, listed as a that's the triungulan larva uh, and it is highly mobile and uh, and a voracious little predator of grasshopper eggs so this female uh, blister beetle is going to lay her eggs near where the grasshoppers have laid their eggs, and this triangular, triangular larvae are going to hatch and they're going to go seeking uh, seeking grasshopper eggs. And they're relative specialists on grasshopper eggs. We do have another species of uh, a rel relatively conspicuous blister beetle. That's you know the big black kind of purpley sheen ones. Those are called nuttalls blister beetle, and those are actually uh, uh, predators as triangular triangular larvae of solitary bees. So they're really not going to have much of an impact on on your uh, grasshopper population, uh, but uh, but uh, they they can be uh, relatively numerous in some fields. Uh, the next photo we'll talk about. You can see this cricket is having a very bad day. Uh, it has had a, what's called an ematomorph or or a horsehair worm. Um, there's no nice way to say it. Uh, the horsehair worm has exploded up the cricket's butt. Uh, so the uh, the cricket has imbibed water that has the ematomorph eggs in it. The, uh, the uh, horsehair worm has developed inside the hemocele or the blood cavity of the, uh, of the cricket. And you can see this is a very large worm. This is the equivalent of uh, you know, a 30 foot worm uh, bursting forth from, uh, from a human. So um, uh, oftentimes when we're talking about parasites and parasitoids, uh, the alien movies uh, arise. And I, I think that would have been a very different franchise with, with this consideration. Um, so, um, uh, the next one we'll, we'll talk about is Mermis, uh, and this is a nematode, uh, is not to be confused with an ematomorph, which is the horsehair worm, different groups, although they look superficially very similar. Um, you can see this one has, uh, has uh, exploded out of this grasshopper as well. They become infected with these feeding on plants, and you can see there's an, an adult nematode here uh, working over a plant. They're going to lay their eggs on the plant surface. Herbivorous insects come, munch on those plants, consume the eggs, and the nematode uh, develops, or nematodes uh, develop inside the hemocele of that uh, unfortunate grasshopper. So yeah, it can be hard to be a bug. Uh, some other ones include tanglebane fly. Uh, these uh, have a really interesting life cycle. Uh, they produce a lot of eggs. So these females are going to produce about 2,500 eggs each, and they're laying them in trees and fence posts, and which seems like a really odd place to lay an egg if your host is a grasshopper. Uh, these eggs are wind distributed. So big winds come up as they do in Saskatchewan, uh, and they blow the eggs around. Uh, so it, it is a really, it's casting a broad net. Um, uh, if these uh, if these uh, eggs happen to uh, to find their way onto a grasshopper and the grasshopper populations are large, there's a chance uh, a good chance they will. Uh, the larvae will develop and consume that uh, that grasshopper as a, as a parasitoid. Uh, there's a, there are also Skelio species egg parasitoids. It's a it's a it's a small uh, parasitic wasp that seeks out uh, grasshopper eggs uh and lays it lays its eggs into into those and and, cons and consumes the uh, developing larva uh, an important pest of grasshopper nymphs are for mica uh, uh, sanguine, uh, sanguinea which is uh, 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 a um, a formicine ant that's relatively common in uh, in saskatchewan you'll see these things large nests uh, oftentimes in pastures these nests can be five feet across uh conspicuous black and uh, black and uh, and red uh, form uh, and, or coloration and uh, and they're aggressive they're, they're they're biters so if you if you're standing in one of their nests you'll be you'll be aware of it uh, happily we don't have any stinging wasps in saskatchewan but uh, 
these guys compensate for that with a really bad attitude. Uh, they are also slave makers. Uh, so they're going to raid uh, in large groups. They'll send out raiding parties to uh, to uh, raid uh, the uh, the uh, colonies of uh, Fusca and Neo uh, Neo uh, uh, Neo uh, Gigati species groups. So other native ant species, and they're actually going to harvest in this case uh, an adult. They will also harvest uh, uh, um, uh, developing pupae and and occasionally eggs of uh, of their victims. Uh, haul these back to their colonies, and they have a caste system. The the new slaves become the lowest caste. So all the dirty work gets done by the slaves. So uh, for those of you who weren't aware, yeah, we have slave making ants in the province. Uh, so uh, we base a lot of our predictions about this coming year about uh, uh, grasshopper populations on conditions associated with last year. And uh, I'm sure you can connect, connect the dots with, with what we're talking about for, the, for this year and predictions for next. Uh, so this is based on modeling done by uh, Owen Olford et al. Uh, in 2020 and published in 2020. Uh, so warm spring uh, important for uh, for an early hatch. Of course, we had a, a cool wet spring last year in, in large number, in large portions of the province that delayed the hatch, but it didn't it didn't put it to a to a, put it to a halt. Uh, and of course, we had very warm conditions, so they could make up for that late hatch with rapid development uh, to uh, to adulthood. Uh, so we get rapid uh, uh, rapid onset of the production of adults. That means there's a lot of eggs going in the ground, and the longer that we have adults active, the more eggs are going to go into the ground. And these can stay active. And when we're talking about two-stripe grasshopper, uh, they will stay active right into right into October. They're going to look very tatty when the when October comes. They're, they've had a lot of close calls, uh, but those that have survived are still getting the last dregs of their uh, dregs dregs of their eggs uh, in, into their into the ground. Uh, so warm conditions conducive uh, to uh, to uh, rapid development and production of eggs, rapid development of nymphs, and success of those nymphs and production of adults. Um, Global positions can be related to adult densities, and so of course, boy needs to meet boy needs to meet girl. Beautiful music plays, eggs go into the ground, uh, and the timing of that, and the timing of the emergence and uh, and uh, and production of adults, uh, very important for that. And of course, we had very dense populations of grasshoppers in the province. Uh, this is based on the 2022 survey, so this is our forecast for 2023. Uh, and uh, this is overlaid or, or standing next to uh, next to the uh, the uh, conditions in July and uh, in August. Not picture, but similar in August. Got a little drier in August last year. Uh, but large numbers of, of grasshoppers in central regions and southern regions, <coughs> and uh, and uh, uh, dry conditions, you know, severe drought in some cases, uh, but not so dry as to kill grasshoppers. Uh, so we've got uh, a bit of a perfect storm for production of grasshoppers this year, in addition to warm spring conditions and timely rains for the production of uh, for the production of green feed for the nymphs. Um, and with that, we'll move on to the next topic, and that is control. Uh, so evaluation of populations and uh, and economic thresholds. Actually, you know what? I, I'm going to go back here. So like, uh, really, everything for next year depends on the conditions in July. Um, there are some factors that could contribute to their to their uh, to, to broad mortality if we get the onset of very cool wet conditions. Uh, it doesn't seem very likely right now. It seems we're going to have continued warm dry conditions and good conditions for overposition. So if we maintain high populations and these conditions, we could be looking at more trouble for next year, uh, barring a cool wet, uh, a very cool wet uh, uh, spring and early summer next year. So uh, economic thresholds, and this, this is applicable for this year. Uh, this, uh, the pest population with, pest, with which pest control measures must be, must be taken to prevent the pest population from rising to the economic injury level. Uh, so sometimes economic injury level and economic threshold or action threshold are, are mistaken. And uh, economic, uh, 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 the economic injury level is that balance between the cost of control and what the grasshoppers are caught, or and what the grasshoppers are costing you. You want to avoid that. So you want to you want to inflict control on them before that happens. And that's what the economic thresholds are associated with. So we've we've got good nominal economic thresholds. So that's it's evidence based, hypothesis based, but not experimentally derived uh, uh, economic thresholds for a lot of different uh, a lot of different uh, pest species. 
and we've got some experimentally derived uh, economic thresholds for others. Uh, typically, an economic threshold is going to be about 80% of the economic injury level, and that is a bit of a rule of thumb, but that's typically where it lies. So, what we're this action threshold, we're we're trying to avoid that economic injury level, uh, where the where the cost of control is not paying for itself. This is going to vary by crop location and grasshopper development, and it varies by pest. But you can see the functional relationship here. Uh, the uh, you know the population continues to grow at the dotted line to the economic injury level unless you inflict control. Then you can knock it down. There's a possibility possibility for it to continue increase and require subsequent subsequent application or or, or uh, uh, subsequent control. But uh, you you've you've negated or or limited the impact of that population to below the economic injury level. So for small mints, uh, the economic uh, threshold. Uh, in crop is 30 to 45 per meter square, and we have certainly seen populations in that range. In the ditch, 50 to 75. Uh, given the conditions this year, I would err on the or err on the low side. That is uh, warm, a lot of activity, uh, and with uh, commodity prices being what they are. Uh, so yeah, I would err on the side of 30 in crop, 50 in ditch. Uh, for adults, uh, this is going to vary by crop. So generally, 10 to 12 per meter square. You do see recommendations of eight, eight to ten. You know, so look at ten per square per square meter as a, as a good general guideline. Uh, there's going to be less tolerance if growing conditions are challenging. Uh, so the you know the grasshoppers impact is going to have, or the pests impact is going to have, more of a damaging effect on that plant, and that needs to be gauged case by case. But generally, ten per square square meter under most growing conditions uh, for uh, for uh, uh, most crops. Uh, for canola and soybean, they're, they're, they're more tolerant to foliar damage, so 14 per square meter is our guideline for that. If they're munching on pods, though, that's, you know, that's obviously that's the cash component of, the, of, of those crops, so uh, you're going to want to weigh those case by case. Uh, typically, canola is not a preferred host plant of these animals, though, again, push comes to shove, everything's on the menu for some of these species. Uh, in the ditch for adults, 21 to 40 per square meter. Uh, oh, sorry, I skipped over one. Uh, we've got a couple of crops that are particularly sensitive. So flax in bowl, uh, grasshoppers can go right underneath that bowl and 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 clip the, and clip it. Uh, so that that's that's knocking off the money part of the plant. So obviously low tolerance for grasshoppers in that crop and lentils in flour. So two per square meter in both of those crops. Flowers are particularly sensitive, as are early development pods and some of these species, particularly packards really likes to munch on early pods. So keep an eye out for those at low numbers. So how to evaluate these populations? There, there are two primary ways. Uh, so I'll, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll illustrate these for you. One is the, the method we use for the provincial survey, and that is to walk a transect. So at, at least 50 meters, and you're, you're going to want to look at different parts, like any evaluation, you're going to want to look at different parts of the field. Uh, determine if they are invading from the edge, if they've made it to the middle of the crop, uh, and this, uh, and, you know, which part of the crop. And this, this will influence the the area that you need to control, or want to consider control, and uh, and uh, and uh, your timing for control as well. So, uh, 50 by one meter. Really, what you what you want to do is uh, this applies to both fields and ditches, and uh, and depends on on of course the stage of the crop. I mean, if you're in, you know, a chest high canola crop. This may not be the may not be the most effective strategy for you. Uh, so hold the meter stick to be able to to estimate the the insects in a one meter field of view. Uh, you know, test that. Put the meter meter square on the ground. You can try holding it up and see where that applies to your field of view. Uh, you're going to want to walk 10 meters of that transect. Record the grasshoppers if populations are high. You want a clicker counter. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, repeat this at least five times. Divide the total count by 50 if you've done five. If you've done 60, divide by uh, uh, divide uh, 60 meters. Divide by or six counts. 60 meters divided by 60. But typically, repeat this five times. Divide by 50, and uh, this will give you your per, per meter uh, population over this 50 50 meter area. So again, you're going to want to monitor uh, multiple locations. Don't make a decision just based on one small set of data. Uh, also, take at least five sweeps sweeps to determine your species. And that'll give you a good indication as, as to what you're dealing with. Because you can have large numbers of grasshoppers in a crop 
not causing damage. Uh, a good example of this is clearwing, where you can see this in broadleaf crops, uh, and they don't really have much interest in it, uh, and they can just be basking to increase their local their their internal temperatures. Uh, so look for damage, look for corresponding damage associated with these animals. So if you're seeing animals and not seeing and not seeing damage, you may not need to may not need to uh, put down control. But obviously, if they are causing damage, then then yeah, release the hounds if they are a threshold. Uh, there's another technique as well, and it's uh, to take 480 degree sweeps in a row, uh, and this works well for high crops, and you can modify this for low crops. Uh, so 480 degree sweeps, so one shoulder to a, to another. If you're in, if you're in a high crop, if you're in a low crop, do a pendulous sweep where you're going to hit about you know, you know, this much of the ground uh, on it. You know, try not to take up soil, um, and uh, and uh, so four kind of loping sweeps as you walk forward. Uh, don't repeat sweep an area because you've already disturbed those insects. No, no double sample, sampling with sweeping. Um, so take the sum and that'll be your green, your, 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 uh, your grasshoppers per square meter. So, uh, you know, uh, I mentioned before in ditches and low plants, um, that, uh, that uh, pendulum swing, uh, it can take a bit of practice. Uh, so, you know, a lot of people when they, when they first start trying this, are going to end up with a sweep net filled full of dirt and a bit of frustration uh, in their hearts. Uh, yeah, practice makes perfect. So, um, yeah, try it out a few times. Make sure your technique is good, and then uh, it is a real time saver uh, for evaluation of populations. You can hit multiple populations more quickly than doing the walking survey. Oh, oh, pardon me. Jumping back and forth between slides. I apologize. Uh, so check the guide to crop protection. There are a lot of products registered in a lot of different crops um, for uh, for grasshopper control. Uh, of course, uh, I'll, I'll talk about some of some of the some of the limitations that we've had uh, put on us recently. Uh, but do not go off label. Uh, I've heard about some reports of some off label applications, uh, and really you can get yourself into some trouble with that. Uh, if you uh, if if you're looking at, look in the guide to crop protection. Um, our, our Pest Management Regulatory Agency of Health Canada demands efficacy data for registration of a product. So if it has grasshopper on the label, you can pretty much take that to the bank that it's going to be efficacious if you follow the label directions. And I'll talk about some of the label directions for, for specific products. Uh, so if it's registered, there's a good reason for it. If it's not, there's also a good reason for it. So uh, consider MRLs as well if you're considering, you know, and please don't go off label. Um, you don't want to get into MRL trouble, so that is maximum residue limit uh, trouble and timing of application can have an impact, impact on that. So follow the, follow the guides on the label. Uh, the label is the law, the label is the law, et cetera. Uh, so some considerations, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, several products, and I'm sure everyone is aware, uh, so several products re uh, registered for grasshopper control uh, uh, have been uh, 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 taken away from us. And of course, several products can significantly impact natural enemies, and they, these can be natural enemies of grasshoppers or of other pests. So, you know, consider that in, into your into your calculus when you're when you're making your decisions for for applications. Um, it's we're, we're seeing populations of other insects come up as well. So, you may not just experience grasshoppers this year, and of course, natural enemies can have a a strong regulate, a regulating factor uh, on, or can be strong regulating factors on pest populations. So the first ones we'll talk about is synthetic pyrethroids. And of course, uh, there has been a lot of news about uh, Lambda cyhalothrin, uh, or uh, so these are the, uh, uh, that's the active ingredient associated with uh, with Matador and Volume Express, Silencer, La Bamba, Zavada. <laughs> Do not use uh, uh, Lambda products if your crop is intended for animal feed. Um, there may be some restrictions from your buyer as well. So check with them if they will accept those crops. I realize that for feed, this is going to compl complicate things a lot, especially with the import of, of feed from the United States. There are a lot of moving parts with this. Uh, but um, yeah, my, my advice is, is be careful with Lambda Cyhalothrin or, or Matador Silencer. Um, so in the case of uh, uh, group three insecticides, and I'm just gonna back up a little bit, these uh, can be extremely effective for young grasshoppers. Uh, and this has, uh, there, there is one exception. In the case of permethrin products, 
And as I recall, that is ship and upside. Uh, these are not registered for grasshopper control. And uh, um, I, I hope someone corrects me if I'm remembering those two products wrong. But in the case of permethrin, these simply do not work very well on grasshoppers, even young ones. So, uh, or at least two stripe grasshopper, that's our primary pest. So you may want to steer clear of that one. There's a reason it's not registered for grasshoppers. Uh, be aware of temperature recommendations with group three insecticides, you know, especially delta methrin products uh, like Desis. Uh, 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 25C is a pretty good cutoff for that one. Uh, you're going to see a lot of vol vol volatilization with that one, uh, and it can't be subject subject to uh, UV breakdown as well. So uh, temperature is going to reduce the efficacy of, of some group threes, especially the uh, delta methrin. Uh, and uh, efficacy is going to be less for mature nymphs and and uh, and adults. So if you're looking at mature nymphs, so that is fifth inch stars with wing buds, and adults, you're going to want to look at other products because you're you're not going to get the efficacy that you're hoping for with uh, group threes. So some examples, and this is for wheat, uh, Desis 100 EC, uh, and several other methrin products. Upside ship. Oh yeah, I apologize. Upside ship is actually cypermethrin. Uh, so I'm, I'm not remembering the uh, the permethrin products. Uh, check the guide to crop, crop protection, though. So uh, permethrin products, don't use those on grasshoppers. Uh, Silencer, Labamba, Zivada. Uh, these are Lambda Sahelithrin. And uh, of course, if you're producing uh, crops for feed, uh, steer clear. Group 28 insecticides or the diamides are effective against adults uh, and mature nymphs. Uh, what freaks people out a little bit about the group 28s is they're not knockdown insecticides like some of the other ones, uh, but you're going to see this rapid uh, cessation of feeding. So the animal's still going to be alive, but it's not feeding, uh, or it's feeding much less, and then it's fine, and then it, and then it will die. But these these products are very effective. Uh, so the Corrigin and Corrigin Max. Uh, group 1B insecticides are some of our older chemistries. Some of these go back to the 1930s. Uh, these are the uh, organophosphates, uh, and they are effective in, against adult grasshoppers, but they're also broadly effective against a lot of other organisms, including a lot of your natural enemies. So consider consider this with control, but uh, you're going to get some 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 good control of grasshoppers with these products. Uh, adult nymph rates are going to differ. See the guide. Uh, Non-selective contact ingestion and vapor action. So the vapor action is associated primarily primarily with chlorpyrifos. Um, now that is, or Laura's band and Zan products that have the same active ingredient. And we've got until December of this year to use stores. You can't buy it anymore. But if you do have stores of uh, our Purifos products, you've got until December of this year to use it. Uh, there's also malathion products. Uh, and in the case of this one, the efficacy actually improves with temperature. So above 20 degrees Celsius, you're going to get an increase in grasshopper physiology. And that helps to increase the toxicity of, of that product or of that active ingredient. There's also dimethoate, uh, and, uh, and uh, this can be a highly efficacious product for grasshoppers. And in the case of dimethoate, you're looking at about eight days of efficacy for these ones. So you got good residual, you've got systemic activity for this one uh, as well. So the group 1Bs can be, uh, can be excellent products for grasshopper control. Baits uh, can also be uh, very effective. Uh, and uh, nolobate, I, uh, I have no personal experience with nolobate, but from what I've seen and from what I've read, uh, it is an efficacious uh, treatment for it. Uh, there were considerations associated with production of this material with their, I believe, California production facility uh, having some issues, uh, but there has been a statement that uh, 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 stocks will be available June of this year, so the end of this month. Uh, this is a biological. It is nosema or paranosema, uh, so all the nosema are now, are now part of the paranosema, uh, as is uh, pretty typical of biology. Uh, so paranosema locuste, it is a biological. Uh, this is actually a, a mobile fungus, um, used to be considered a, prote a protist. Uh, the protists are now part of the fungi, um, as is biology, right? So uh, so anyway, long and short of it, uh, they uh, you can get uh, 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 good control of this year's population, and you can get horizontal transmission and vertical transmission. So horizontal transmission is, you know, me to that guy, and vertical transmission would be mother to progeny. And uh, so you can get transmission of the, of the pathogen there. So you can actually get long-term control of the population. And I've read as much as 10 years of suppression of populations. So it can be uh, an excellent uh, uh, solution for for grasshopper control. 
Uh, so, uh, you know, so applications to fields might know about broad harvestable food commodities in the present, uh, present pardon me, uh, generally, generally pre-bloom. You can see the recommendations associated with this product associated with the label. So if you are interested in, in getting supplies of this, uh, so am I. I'm, I'm very interested in testing it and, and I'm, I'm curious to test it on my own place. Um, EcoBrand is another product. This is a group 1A or Carbaryl. Uh, another very old chemistry, uh, not specific, but it needs to be ingested. Uh, so PMRA has actually limited the uses of this one. Uh, so some recent restricted uh, restrictions, so corn, alfalfa, clover, wheat, oats, barley, rye, sweet white lupins have been removed from the label. Uh, so there are still applications where you can use this. Uh, so it is a carbaryl impregnated bran flake. Uh, I, this is one I do actually have some experience with, and it and it works very well. Um, it will it will uh, kill a large number of grasshoppers in relatively short order. So, uh, however, do consider other things that may be consuming those brand flakes. Uh, cultural control can also be uh, uh, helpful with grasshoppers. You're not going to get knocked down with cultural control, though, and you're not going to get you know uh, total mitigation of grasshopper damage. Damage. Pardon me, but it can reduce uh, the impact of grasshoppers. Uh, early early seedling of crops, so you're going to have more 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 resilient plants uh, that can take a little bit more damage, especially for those that uh, you know like canola and soybean that can take a fair bit of full year damage. Uh, crop rotation can be important. Uh, so two strike grasshopper uh, doesn't prefer oats or peas, uh, so these can be you know if you you know. Uh, um, uh, good choices for uh, rotational crops to limit grasshopper impact, limit their reproductive success, and limit the number of numbers of eggs that are going into the ground for next year. Uh, tillage has been demonstrated to be effective, although recent recent studies have haven't been done. Uh, this is relying on a lot of the work that was done in the uh, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and slightly more recently. Uh, but the thinking on this one is rather than the tillage contributing to mortality of the eggs in the soil, you're taking away that early green feed for the nymphs. So you're you're basically starving them out with tillage. Uh, of course, full tillage is 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 not the uh, is not the current trend. With uh, where we you know we're looking at at, at you know low till or zero till uh, currently. Uh, trap strips have been demonstrated to be effective. So that is alternating uh, cultivated green strips of about 10 meters uh, and uh, around a field. Uh, the more times you can do that, functionally you're trying to concentrate those grasshoppers on the green strips. And you know, preventing you know, providing a, a zone of starvation for the nymphs that they won't cross. So if you can concentrate those nymphs, you can limit those populations with an insecticide application, uh, or or another technique if you prefer, um, and limit the area that that, that needs to be applied. Uh, so green strips can be seeded to wheat, so it can be to an alternate crop or to another preferred crop of the species that you have in your area. Uh, and with that, I will ask people to please sign up to allow us to access your fields. Um, for the grasshopper survey, of course, we use uh, SEIC uh, does the sampling for uh, the Ministry of Agriculture, and, and my hat's off to them for, for excellent work. Um, but they will be sampling roadsides and ditches, uh, but we need access uh, for other surveys. So please point, point your phone at this QR code. Uh, a little menu will pop down and, uh, and fill in the fields, and you'll be You'll be entered into uh, a lottery to win a survey of your field. Great.